So hello everybody and uh, welcome to this week's SEDS Online webinar. And as always, we'd like to uh, thank our sponsor uh, IS, which allows us to offer all of these resources for free. And that includes recorded lectures, learning tools, and even virtual field trips. So please take a look on the website uh, to see all the new info. And today's speaker is Dr. Lorna Jane Strachan, um, and she obtained her honors degree at the University of Leeds before receiving a PhD from Cardiff University and Imperial College of London in the UK. Lorna is now a senior lecturer in sedimentology at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, on top of being a prominent researcher in the fields of turbidity currents and soft sediment deformation. Her research focuses on understanding the way in which sediment moves and are deposited in the deep ocean, integrating modern seafloor bathymetry and core data with ancient outcrop and seismic data and experimental flu modeling. Today, she will present us uh, some of the uh, results that her and her teammates have put together uh, decipherring, God damn it, missed it, decipherring the earthquake and volcanic signals in the Hukarangi Channel offshore New Zealand. So that, with that being said, uh, the floor is yours, Lorna, and I will disappear. Thank you. Um, kia ora koto, everyone. Hello and welcome. Um, so it's pitch black here, 10 o'clock in the evening, and so I hope where you are, it's daylight and you can enjoy this. And so I want to talk to you about um, some work that me and a huge team of researchers have been working on um, on the Hikarangi margin based in New Zealand. And I say it's a huge team. So I've listed here all the people that have been involved with working on the margin with me. Um, and so on the left, we can see here, we have a whole series of postgraduate students who have been based at a number of universities, including University of Auckland and University of Victoria, Wellington. And um, many of my colleagues are based at NIWA, which is the National Institute of Water and Atmosphere based in New Zealand and um, from all around the world. And this work has been possible thanks to funding and a number of voyages um, many of which have been aboard Niwa's vessel, the Tangaroa, and I just thought I'd let you know what Tangaroa means in Māori, it means the god of the sea, so this is their biggest vessel. Um, we've had, um, I was telling up, I think six voyages in all where we have collected core data um, that is forming, in, informing our understanding of what's going on in here. Um, and these include funding streams from the New Zealand government, um, but also from elsewhere. So um, Marum, based in Germany, also had a sauna voyage and some of the, the data they collected it would fall under our understanding here. Um, very hopeful for some future funding and should find out in the next week or two if we get a bit more funding to support this and chase this question um, head on. So where is the Hikarangi Channel? So I thought I'd start with some basics so here's a map of New Zealand. So if you're based in Northwest Europe, you basically want to tunnel through planet Earth, come out on the other side and you'll hit New Zealand. So in the Southern Ocean and New Zealand itself is composed of two main islands. And in terms of land mass, it's about the same size of, as the UK. And um, New Zealand is obviously based uh, uh, in the Pacific and we have a huge amount of water around us. So we really are in the middle of nowhere. And I just wanted to highlight to you on this, this regional bathymetry image, um, these lighter areas, and these form the shelf, but also thick crust, over thickened crust, continental crust, that form the submerged continent of Zealandia. Um, and so these kind of represent a really tumultuous history in the formation of New Zealand that we see reflected today. And as you can see on this bathymetry map, we've got a distinct feature here. So this is a subduction zone 
where the Pacific plate to the right is being subducted beneath um, the Australian plate to the left. Down off the South Island, there's also a distinct feature here. This is another subduction zone. This is called the Puisiga subduction zone. And in here, the Australian plate is being subducted beneath the Pacific plate. And in between, you can imagine there's lots of torsion between those two subduction systems. And we have one of the world's largest strike slip faults, which forms the Alpine fault here. So if we zoom in here, and I hope you guys like this image. So Val was mentioning he liked the bathymetry and I've, I've kind of really gone for it with the hillshade here and, and slightly vertically exaggerated things to, to show off the margin. But we can see the Hikarangi Channel in all of its glory um, here. So it sort of starts with its headwaters on the eastern part of the South Island, traverses um, to the east, of the North Island has this strange um, dog leg and moves out this way. So in terms of water depth, um, it initiates at about 30 meters water depth all the way up here in the Kaikaura Canyon. And as we move right out into the distal part, it's about five and a half kilometers water depth. It's a big channel. So the width varies from between one to 12 kilometers wide and a whole variety of depths. And the channel length itself is thought to be about 2000 kilometers long. So if we focus in on this area up here, so where we've got that dog leg, I've got a couple of seismic lines to show you what the Hikarangi channel looks like um, if we were to take a cross section through the margin. So the first line I'm showing you is this one. So oriented northwest um, to southeast. And here we can see a really beautiful, conspicuous feature of the Hikarangi channel itself. So that really nice UV-shaped channel. And bearing in mind here, you know, we're about 700 kilometers from the source. So next I'm going to show you this seismic line going approximately up north-south. So north is to the right on here, south is to the left. And we can see in here a series of buried older versions of the Paleo Hikarangi Channel. And um, we don't really know what the age of the inception is, but the reason that we have so many seismic lines here is that there is an IODP drill site that was drilled in 2018, where we've got really detailed stratigraphy going through it. So we're currently kind of working in on that. And the seismic stratigraphy of this upper unit is um, part of a MSc project with Anthony Shorrock, who's an MSc student of mine at Auckland, and we're working with Niwa on this. So just to give you a little bit of context for the margin, which is really important to try and understand the processes that are going on here. So if we look at the Hikarangi subduction margin, so here the deformation front is marked by this bold black line, the subduction margin itself is characterized by oblique um, subduction. And the Pacific plate to the right here um, is actually over thickened crust that has a whole series of seamounts on it. So the plate that's being subducted is very, very rough. So it has a lot of asperities on it. And what that means is if we look at the, if we look at geodetic data, so lots of colleagues at GNS Science, which is a little bit like a geological survey of New Zealand, predominantly led by an amazing scientist called Laura Wallace, they have found that um, the roughness of the plate that's being subducted means that parts of the margin of the plate are locked and stuck. So these are the areas in red and then other parts are slowly creeping past each other. And this is important when we want to think about the kind of seismicity that we might expect to see on this margin. So again, if we zoom up into North Hikarangi up here, so um, here we can see on the right, three drilling sites. So these were for the recent IODP expedition, which is if any of you want to look it up, it's Expeditions 372 and 375. But the reason I've got this image 
here. Um, so this is from a recent paper by Phil Barnes from NIWA in Science Advances. And this summarizes the range of seismicity kind of processes that we have going on in the margin. And this area here is where the plate is creeping and we see a range of, of activities. So we see tremor, we see slow slip earthquakes and we see micro earthquakes. And these contours that we can see in here, these mark um, an area where there was a slow slip earthquake happening. So a magnitude seven earthquake that happened for several months. And so there was, there was the displacement, but no one felt it. But also on this margin, we have large earthquakes in the overriding upper plate. And then from time to time, we think it's likely that we get large mega thrust earthquakes on that subduction interface itself. So if, um, I've just highlighted in here a line. So I'm just gonna look at a regional seismic line across the margin, just to give you a bit of context for the sort of sedimentary basin systems that we're looking at. And again, this is from an earlier paper by Phil Barnes. So we have an uninterpreted seismic line on the top and uh, interpreted one on the bottom. So for any of you who are well used to working on passive margins, this may create a little bit of a headache. But the reason I wanted to show you this was that we can really nicely see the subduction interface and then the intense deformation above. So there's the potential to create a range of seismic behaviors, including these mega thrust earthquakes um, along this margin. And, and I've been part of a bigger program where we're trying to see how big and how often those mega thrust ruptures might occur on the margin. So the other result of the subduction here is that there is significant volcanic unrest beneath the North Island of New Zealand in particular. And the sort of main locus of that volcanism is an area, uh, is a line of volcanoes that we call the Topol Volcanic Zone. And for any of you who have been to New Zealand to visit, it's likely that you may have visited this and done the Tongariro crossing. And here, if we look at this line of spectacular um, volcanoes, you transverse these when you do the Tongariro crossing. On the bottom, I've got a picture of what looks to be a beautiful quiescent lake. Don't let this fool you. This is a super volcano. So this is the Topol volcano itself. And this has blown um, several times and is absolutely huge. So a lot of volcanism, which is active um, and the potential for, for more and obviously ongoing. Then the other thing to think about when we want to think about um, Hikarangi is the weather. So New Zealand is famous for its weather, which means basically rain but we get dominant westerly winds. So off the Tasman Ocean, the dominant wind direction is towards the west. We can get intense rain events and with all the subduction and the thick plate that's being subducted, we have really high um, rates of uplift. So what this means is we have very high sediment flux to the ocean. So we have high sedimentation rates and very um, expanded sedimentary records, which means that we can tease apart um, what's going on. Also, just to say, this little hole in the middle of the North Island, that is Lake Topor. So that is the super volcano. And what happens is when these volcanoes erupt, because we've got our westerly wet winds, most of the ash gets blown to this east margin and is generally well, very well preserved as marine tephras. So to the Hikarangi channel system itself. So as I mentioned in the sort of introduction to the channel, it's a really big um, system, particularly for one associated with a convergent margin. And um, unlike perhaps textbook examples of canyon to channel transitions, um, the Hikarangi channel system itself is fed by multiple canyons. At least 10 are feeding it today. And I'm just going to highlight uh, some of them. 
perhaps slightly more famous ones or eye-catching ones. So this one that we can see here is called the Pegasus Canyon. This is the Kaikoura Canyon. This is the Cook Strait Canyon. And this one that looks like a cookie cutter halfway along is um, the Madden Canyon. And I just want you to note that the canyons themselves have a variety of orientations and the shelf, um, over the shelf width over which they're cutting into and incising into is very different. So today they provide um, drainages from um, rivers and shelfful sediments from both the North and South Islands. But if we go back in time a little bit, let's say 20,000 years to the last glacial maximum, all most of those canyon systems, so I found um, this amazing image of New Zealand during the last glacial maximum, whereby they've used the present day bathymetry to come up with a really nice map. And I saw an amazing one of Australia when I was looking earlier as well. And you can see that some of these canyons would basically be meeting potentially river mouths during the last glacial maximum. So it's, and New Zealand was one island. So, you know, things were rather different during the, the low stands to today in terms of um, delivery of sediment to those canyon systems. So I want to, I'm going to link now to a movie of the Kaikoura earthquake. So I'm going to click on this and um, get a YouTube video playing. This is the hope. I'll maximize this. Okay, here we go. So this simulation shows the earthquake that happened in Kaikoura in November 2016. And this earthquake was a 7.8 uh, magnitude earthquake. And it was pretty complicated. So we had rupture on 21 different faults and a directionality. So the rupture itself moved towards the north and northeast with time. And this simulation kind of shows the intensity and the shaking and how that spread out during that time. And the buildings that are wobbling are buildings that were in Wellington, which was actually quite severely hit. But hopefully you can see that there's quite intense shaking on the sediment source areas in the shelf area. So beautiful animation about this um, event. And it was pretty devastating to, to the um, communities who lived nearby. So while this um, earthquake happened, it just so happened that the team, including three of the students that I worked with, were at sea aboard the Tongaroa. And they were collecting um, cores to look at the paleo seismic record on the margin. So the first thought was, oh, there was a tsunami. So checking that they were OK. Um, and their voyage, they were coming to the end of their voyage and it had gone really well. So they made the decision to divert along the margin and go back towards Kaikoura and to sample um, the seafloor there to see if they could capture any deposit that had happened during the earthquake. So some of the effects from the earthquake on shore were localized coastal uplift and the little town of Kaikoura itself was inundated by a tsunami. There was a lot of landsliding in the sort of surrounds to the area and a lot of devastation to the infrastructure. So this incredible picture of this train track that has been shunted off the train track line and across the state highway by this landslide. So there was an enormous amount of damage to um, the infrastructure and property in the area. And as the earthquake happened, so it, it started shaking for about 90 seconds or well, the rupture took 90 seconds to occur. And I think shaking lasted for something like two and a half minutes. So as it did this, those many canyons that I mentioned underwent intense shaking. And in several of those canyons, landslides were triggered. 
They moved down the steep, steep canyon walls themselves, and some of those ignited and evolved into turbidity currents. And here's an example of an experimental one that we made a few years ago um, here in Auckland. And as you can tell, this margin is one that we've been working on for, for a long time and people have been looking at it for different reasons. And um, in the Kaikaura Canyon itself, Joshua Mountjoy, who's at Niwa, um, led a science advances paper that was published in 2018 that built upon this amazing bathymetric data set that he had collected. So he had collected in the head of the Kaikaura Canyon bathymetry data. So I just want to draw your attention to this tiny square. And in the top, you can see that this is the, the the rim of the Kaikaura Canyon before the earthquake. Then Joshua got money to go back and re-survey um, the site. And again, this is the same location. And you can see that the rim of that canyon system has basically been completely excavated um, of sediments. So there's been multiple landslides. And in this difference map that he generated in his paper, just to get your eye in, the red colors, so the browns and the dark red, they show up to 40 meters of erosion and the cooler blues show sites of deposition. So um, by his calculations, Joshu calculated that there were 850 metric megatons mobilized um, during the event. In um, some recent work that's still um, under review, led by Jamie Howarth, who's at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, so again, with some more follow-on surveys. So these were conducted eight months after the earthquake. So the first calls that we got were three days after the earthquake. So um, when the team pulled those up, it was pretty much still sloppy soup probably still settling out of the water column, but then they went back eight months later and collected a whole series of cores. And what Jamie's really novel work has shown is that turbidity currents were triggered in nine of the canyons um, of, of part of this margin, but not all of them. So just the ones that have red dots are the sites where turbidites were found. Where there are crosses, there were no turbidites. And I think the interesting thing to note is that northerly direction of the fault rupture <laughs> and how that um, is echoed in what canyons were actually triggered. In terms of how far down the Hikarangi Channel, so obviously all of these canyons feed into the Hikarangi Channel. So we've also traced the um, turbidites in the Hikarangi Channel itself. And we've managed to find these at least 680 kilometers from the head of the Kaikaura Canyon. And I say at least because at that distance, the turbidite's about 70 centimeters thick. We simply haven't gone any further um, to sample yet. We're hoping to do that, but we haven't got to it yet. So on the right, here is um, a line scan image, uh, a screenshot from a CT scan, and my interpretive log just showing you one of the examples of the co-seismic event bed. <clears throat> and here is another example from Jamie's paper, just showing you the range of deposit types that we've got here. So, how do we chase this earthquake and volcanic signal on this margin? Well, the way to do it depends on the time scale that you're interested in. So the first thing that we're doing is we're looking at the deposit characteristics from the Kaikaura event bed itself. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So these are generally less than one meter multi-cores and all the dots that are colored in yellow that we've got here are those examples. 
Next, we're trying to trace deposits. So tephras and earthquake triggered turbidites during the late Holocene. And to do that, these are the green dots that we've got across the margin. <clears throat> and for these, we use slightly longer cores, gravity cores that are generally about 10 meters or less. But how do we chase this if we want to go even deeper in time? So um, the IODP um, drill site 1520 allows us to go into deeper time. So this is the first long core to be drilled on the trough, and it's about 900 meters long. And the first 100 meters represents about the last 40,000 years of deposition. And we're looking at that core um, and looking at the integrated 2D seismic that goes with that. <coughs> going to have to have a drink here. My voice box has gone to sleep. <clears throat> and potentially, we want to look at even longer record of trying to work out when we've had volcanic eruptions and potentially earthquake triggered turbidites. And if we get the extra funding um, for this, that will be what we'll try and target with that work. And that would work with the huge IODP team that are already looking at the seismic data of those deeper um, sites. So if we look at the co-seismic turbidite, so this is work very much still in progress. We have had um, several coring campaigns of the event bed since its emplacement in 2016. And what we found <coughs> is that this is an incredibly diverse deposit probably unsurprisingly, given that it's been triggered um, from multiple initial turbidity currents, but incredible diversity, and I guess quite different deposits than you would anticipate from kind of a single surge from a single landslide. Generally very silty, the deposits that we see here with some sand. So we're kind of talking um, mixed flows, so there's clays, silt and sand, but uh, silt is the predominant um, feature. These deposits have started to become biosubated as well. And here's a, a snapshot of images again. This is from Jamie Howarth's paper, just showing you some of the diversity that we see in the co-seismic event bed types. So from beautiful parallel laminations with load casts and flame structures, through to um, banded units with shell, shelly material um, to almost massive normally graded successions um, in, in our deposit. So then if we look in slightly deeper time, so um, into the late Holocene record, we've had some really exciting um, results with looking at the macro tephras. And this is work that's been led by um, Jenny Hopkins, who's based at the Victoria University of Wellington. And she's a volcanologist and she's really specialized in marine tephras. And we've been able to track in multiple cores a range of marine tephras with depth. And um, by combining all the observational um, data that we've collected with brain size and mineralogy and all the volcanological um, geochemistry that Jenny has led looking at the glass shards, we've been able to distinguish four different tephra types. So the first are primary tephras that we see at the base of this log here in the top right hand corner. These are essentially massive and normally graded. Then we have remobilized tephras that if, you could think of these as volcanoclastic turbidites. So these have tractional bed forms. We also have things that we refer to as blebs. So um, these are interpreted as either um, scour, like erosion scours or burrows. And then we have kind of composite um, complex deposits that, that, that show repetition of primary and remobilized deposits. And the really great thing with the tephras is that Jenny 
has been able to use those and look at the uh, glass shard geochemistry to um, distinguish different aged eruptions and build a robust <coughs> chronology, tephra stratigraphy, that we can situate the um, clastic turbidites within. So then starting to look at the Holocene then to see if we can distinguish seismogenic turbidites from other kinds of turbidites in the record. And I wanted to show you this beautiful image from one of the students' thesis. This is from Monique McEwen, who finished a couple of years ago, and Jenny um, used this image in her paper as well. And this is the Madden Canyon. So um, some of the people at Leeds have been working on this and they're really interested in this site as well. And if we look at some of Monique's um, cores, so just to get your eye in for scale, we're generally at the bottom here, we're at 3.8 meters. And we've been able to trace around tephras and we've also done carbon dating in here. And um, the team now are just about to start doing the detailed work on tracing around any units that may be um, paleo uh, earth seismogenic turbidites. And we've had some very exciting recent um, advances in the work um, led by um, a student called Stephanie Tickle, who's based at Victoria University of Wellington, that we think has been a really amazing breakthrough that will really help us correlate these features around. And then using good old fashioned FASIS analysis, help us decipher the different kinds of turbidite types and what are most likely to be seismogenic. So then if we go into deeper time then and think about our Pleistocene record um, and move up to um, IODP site 1520D, we're also pushing ahead with trying to understand that. So um, Adam Woodhouse, who's at Leeds, who might be on, I don't know if you are, hello. He's, he was on the, the IODP voyage and um, a ship-based scientist, and he's developed an isotope stratigraphy for this part of the, um, the upper 100 meters. We've got um, carbon dates, there's magneto stratigraphy, and the volcanologists are working on the tephra stratigraphy. So we're really, at this point in time, building a robust um, age model and we're chucking all of the stratigraphic methods that we possibly can at it. We've been absolutely dumbfounded with the sedimentation rates here. So at 110 meters, the ages that we're getting are 42,000 years. So the sedimentation rate is absolutely nuts. A range of tephras through it, which um, have good geochemical fingerprinting that will allow us to correlate our other um, age models. Then if we get the funding, then the fun starts and we'll, we'll chuck some statistics at this, maybe some machine learning methods to try and decipher our different turbidite types, but also link back to our contemporary Kaikoura event bed and our Holocene records to test this. And here's just a sneaky peek of what um, some of these cores look like. So this is from about 20 meters um, water depth. So here I've got a line scan, a simple interpretation of that, and then um, a raw data CT scan, and then an interpretation. So you can, the CT scans are just incredible. So if, if you work with modern sediment cores and you, you, you know about CT scans, but if you haven't used them before, they are amazing. So you can fly in 3D through your core and the sedimentary structures, as you can see um, annotated here, are absolutely exquisite. So you can kind of lose yourself in this. Okay, so that's me. So to conclude then, I think the Hikarangi margin provides a really great promise as an archive for past earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, but we really have to refine our age models and um, 
our detailed turbidite facies analysis to really form the backbone of this work. We've got some challenges, obviously. So there's a high frequency of earthquakes. There are multiple trigger mechanisms for turbidity currents as well. And one issue that we've had is we are actually finding it quite difficult to distinguish hemipelagite from turbidite tail. And I saw a paper came out last week that looked very useful where people have, um, I think the group from Royal Holloway have come up with some potential methods that we could chuck at this as well. But I think the key to understanding this sedimentary system is taking a truly multidisciplinary approach um, to understand um, the sedimentary record of what's going on. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lorna. This is a very, very good, uh, very, very good talk. Very interesting. And uh, so first thing I also would like to, uh, I don't know if it's congratulating is a good term, but I really appreciate the fact that you advertise the work of your students, you know, from uh, bachelor, master students. It's, uh, I, I, it's very, very cool. I very, very like it. Oh, without, without them, like we couldn't do it. And they've all just, they've, We'd be very lucky we've had brilliant, brilliant students. It's mm. actually the best part of my job. Like, <laughs> genuinely, the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, just remind people to write a question in the chat and send it to everyone. Um, and I will read them online. Um, so I might just start with mine while people might, might be typing. Um, last last week, we had Michi Strasser, who was talking about uh, you know some of uh, the work that uh, they were doing in Japan. Do you see uh, any evidence between magnitude of the earthquake and the thickness of the different turbidites you have down the channel or not? Uh, I don't think we would be able to show that at the moment. Okay. So the only way we could test that is if Kaikaura ruptured mm. and we had a different magnitude event. Mm. I, I think, I don't think it's as simple as that though, because I think in terms of, of how much sediment volume goes into those flows is you need to see how much sediment is kind of stored in that canyon. Mm. So you need a period of residence time for the shelf processes to deliver sediment in there that when there is a quake, it goes. So I don't think it's quite a, a simple sort of magnitude versus... Yeah. thickness um, relationship hmm. I think I have no idea if we'll be able to answer that I think actually trying to decipher what is seismogenic hmm. from say storm induced potentially is a challenge hmm. um, um, hopefully we can use the aerial distribution and the the correlations but um, well, I'm pretty certain we can, um, but I think inferring magnitude, you know, it, it, in non-historic earthquakes, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I guess the paleo seismology method of, of um, you know, fingerprinting and showing the area of which it's it's ruptured yeah. is, is the way to do it, the classic sort of gold finger method. Yeah. So we got a question now from uh, Stephen from Wales. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. You mentioned early cores were still soup. How long do you think until these dewater? Well, when we went back eight months later, they were really dewatered. They were beautiful cores. Um, and I know when the team on the boat um, got up those early cores, you know, they literally stood them on their side and the water kind of left in days. But I, I don't, I don't know. So I did a few back of the envelope because we don't know how thick the flow was. So I did a few back of the envelope calculations for thinking about settling velocities. If the plume of the turbidity current was quite thick. And I think it's likely that even though they sampled three, three days after the event, I don't think the entire turbidite had deposited. So that very, very distal um, sort of hemi-turbidite component was still 
slowly settling out of the water column. Because um, as I mentioned, you know, they're fairly silty, but they also have clays in them. All right, uh, moving on to the next question from Keo Gata from Italy. Thanks a lot, Lorna, great talk. So there's actually two questions, or maybe. Uh, one, I was wondering if the large scale bedrooms noticeable in the morphobathymetry were chondroid drifts, and two, if those highs were remobilized during the earthquake, as may be seen on the map from um, Monjo et al. So I think this might be the one. So um, I have to say lots of these features that you can see on this image are definitely artifacts of what I've done to this image to make it look a bit dramatic. But we know we have actually very high bathymetry data um, along this part of the channel in places it's 10 meters. And we know that lots of them are sediment waves that are actually linked to the channel itself. So they're overbank sediment waves. Uh, and what was the second part of the question? Uh, if those highs were remobilized during the earthquake. That um, we don't know. So Joshu went back and, and did resurvey this area. And he has been out at sea again. They got back two days ago. And again, I think the focus has been really the Kaikaura, like that's his baby, the, the Kaikaura Canyon. So they were using AUVs from the Eurofleet. So getting even higher resolution stuff to look at, at smaller scale bed forms. Um, so I guess the answer to that is I don't think we have the data to do any difference um, analyses on, on those sites yet the further out, further down system. Hmm. Uh, next, we have uh, Yusuf Brahim, who says, thank you. Uh, great. Then we have uh, Jeff Beekle saying, hi, Lorna. Amazing. Is this large scale degradation of the Hukarangi channel and its associated surroundings the reason why there is no obvious fan at the end? Does it also help explain the apparent longevity of the system? So the question about the fan at the end is quite interesting. And I've, um, speaking of people at Leeds, this is Henry Pantin, who was at Leeds. So Henry used to be in New, Ze in New Zealand as well. Um, and so he, him and Keith Lewis published this, but this was based on data from quite a few years before, sort of the late 80s and the 90s. And that's the last time that they've been out here. And what they're, and so the data that's on this bathymetry here is, is very low resolution. So we're kind of looking at a mosaic of data. So out here we're at 250 meters resolution. But what they found, so there are some seismic lines that they took, um, was that there is a fan, but it's a fan drift system. And so they think that the channel, they interpreted the channel to continue up here a move into a drift. So there are insane bottom currents that I'll just go um, on the, um, coming up from Antarctica and they go around this, which is called the Chatham Rise. And then they move back up here and they, they get funneled into the Tonga Kermadec Trench, which is, the, which is an extension that is called Hikarangi Subduction Zone here, Tonga Kermadec Trench here. It's just a geographical name. So. In terms of a fan, we, we literally don't know it, what, what's there. Like, we think there's a fan drift, but it, it's almost no man's land. So um, I was mentioning, we're hoping to go further. So we've, we've really stopped here. So we are hoping we've got a voyage coming up next year. And at this point in time, when we're still working out what we're gonna do, but we might, go distal and see if we can chase the, this end of things. Um, but I just think there's high aggradation. I just think there's just so much sediment coming off New Zealand. Like it's moving up and it's being torn down at, at the same rate of uplift. I just want to make quickly make sure, do you 
Because there are a bunch of questions coming. Do you have time to answer them all, do you think? Or? I've got... I've got 10 minutes and then I've got to go before they lock the car park. All right, uh, so we'll, we'll do it quickly then. Uh, next question is from Ed Pope from uh, Durham. Hi Lorna, thanks for the great talk. Have you been able to distinguish turbidite originating from the South Island end of the system from those originating from the Northern Islands end of the system in the downstream end of the Hukarangi channel? Can you do this with the turbidite geochemistry, for example? So there's some, yes, is the answer. There's um, in terms of the IODP site, um, Mike Underwood, who's part of the team, has done a lot of XRD um, work on the clays within the turbidites and found a very, very distinct signature between North and South Island, basically volcanic and non-volcanic clay types. And also a colleague um, in California called Kathy Marsaglia has gone to look at all of the rivers on the South and North Island and collected um, the sediment in those rivers as traces for us to do it. So, um, but to do that in the sands as well. So yes, in the clays, we can see a difference um, and we're hoping we will be able to see it in the sands. The other thing that we're doing is we're, we're looking for, for that upper unit that I'm working um, with Anthony, the master's student on, and Phil Barnes and Helen Bostock, um, is we're doing the seismic stratigraphy of that. And what's really interesting is that there are two channel systems feeding this, this site up here. So there's the Hikurangi, and there's also the Poverty ca Canyon system. So obviously that's coming straight down off the North Island. Uh, then we have a question from Daniel Heron in Vienna saying, thanks, Lorna, a great talk. Just follow question and Val's question. So Michi Strasser last week suggested that turbulence can last for very long times in uh, various canyons up to, uh, I think it was two months. Um, can some of the soupy material reflect long term and ongoing turbulences? I reckon it could, it sure could, yeah. Yeah, I would think that that's likely. Um, the, the one thing with this margin is that there are bottom currents. Um, so while the, the really fast bottom currents are going around here, there are some other currents that, that would be shifting anything like that around a bit. Hmm. All right, I think then the last question that I see there is from Dan Tech. Um, from Leeds. Hi Lorna, fantastic talk, fantastic talk and thanks for staying up to give it. Uh, I second that. Do you see any sedimentological evidence in the cause in the uh, trough of flow interaction between flows coming from slope traversing systems such as uh, the Madden and overbank flow from the Hikurangi channel? That's a good question and um, I I think it it's hard to resolve with the data set that we've got in terms of the Holocene record. Um, but we could chase it by doing, I think, the geochemistry that, that the team have been doing on the IODP borehole. In terms of the seismic stratigraphy, we, we, which we get lucky on, depending on where the seismic lines are, we might be able to visualize big cross-cutting um, interplay. Um, yeah, so to the north, though, the Poverty Canyon, we really do see that. We see, see them kind of stacking on together. Um, all right, I think that was the last one coming in. Uh, if people you see have question, please write in the chat. I think we'll let Lorna escape the car park. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, on behalf of everybody, I'm going to thank you again very, very much. And. Uh...